Hello citizens of internet. I am Professor Ajit Verkod from Mumbai, India. Today I am going to discuss transformation zone and nematocysts using diagrams and illustrations. Not only is this topic important from the point of view of development of carcinoma of cervix, but also from the point of view of MRCOG part 2 examinations and NEET PG examination. As is my trademark, first some basics. The cervix is a fibromuscular organ. The first thing that I want to emphasize is that the cervix and uterus are not one organ which many gynecologists or students think, especially when it comes to anatomical features like antiversion and antiflexion and pathologies like pelvic organ prolapse. The cervix measures about 3 to 4 centimeters in length and 2.5 centimeters in diameter. The opening between the uterine cavity and the cervix is called the internal os. The canal between the internal and external os is called the endocervical canal. The tissue surrounding the endocervical canal is called endocervix. To emphasize my point about the cervix and the uterus being separate and different organs, I will say this. The cervix has its own anatomy, its own physiology, and its own pathology, especially cancer. Remember, carcinoma of cervix and carcinoma of endometrium are different cancers. Just because they are adjacent to one another and continuous with one another, it does not mean that they are the same organ. The picture on the left is an actual closer view of the normal nulliparous cervix. The nulliparous cervix has a smooth rounded pinpoint external loss. The picture in the middle is an actual closer view of the normal multiparous cervix. The parous cervix has an uneven and wide often described as having a fish mouth appearance of external os. The parous cervix is more bulky than the nulliparous cervix. The picture on the right is an actual closer view of the normal multiparous cervix with ectropion which I will explain later. The pictures are taken from Atlas of Colposcopy. Reference is mentioned below. Look at the magnified view of the cut section of the endocervix. The inner surface of the endocervix is irregular as it is formed by numerous mucosal folds called endocervical crypts. This is a microscopic picture showing actual endocervical cells. The innermost layer is a single layer of tall columnar cells with basal nuclei. Between the columnar cell layer and the stroma are few cells called the reserve cells. These reserve cells are bipotent, that is, they undergo mitosis and replace the columnar cells that are shared. Under certain circumstances, which I will allude to later, they can also form squamous epithelium. That's the reason why they are called bipotent cells. The endocervical single layer lining has one characteristic feature, a drawback if I may call it, which has important bearing on the formation of transformation zone. The columnar cells are shed very easily. The slightest trauma or friction can cause sheets of columnar cells to be detached and lost, as shown in the picture. The endocervical lining has one more characteristic feature. The capillaries supplying blood to the mucosa run in juxtaposition to the single layer of columnar cells, and this proximity to the columnar cells gives the endocervical mucosa a red velvety appearance when viewed through the colposcope. Under magnification, it looks like a spread of grapes as shown in the diagram. As opposed to the endocervix, the ectocervix is lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium depicted here in the diagram by pink lining. They are not as prone to damage as endocervical columnar cells. 
दे आर शेड फ्रॉम टाइम टू टाइम बट नॉट ट्रोमेटाइज इजली दिस इज अस्टोलॉजिकल स्लाइड शोइंग नॉन कैरेटनाइज स्टेटिफाइड फेमस एपिथिलियम ऑन एच एन ई स्टेन इट हैज डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ सेल्स दे आर फ्रॉम इन साइड आउटवर्ड्स बेजल लेयर पैराबेजल सेल लेयर इंटरमीडिएट सेल लेयर एंड लेयर ऑफ सुपरफिशियल सेल्स सिंस दिस हैज बेरिंग ऑन वजाइनल साइटोलॉजी ऑफ पैफमियर आई विल नॉट ट्वेल फर्दर ऑन दिस एस्पेक्ट Now I will discuss the most important part of this E lecture that is the squamo columnar junction the first thing to keep in mind is that the squamo columnar junction is dynamic and not static age and hormonal status are the most important factors influencing location of the squamo columnar junction at birth and during the premenarchal years the squamo columnar junction is located at or very close to the external os the squamo columnar junction undergoes continuous remodeling under the influence of hormones mainly estrogen the original squamo columnar junction present at birth is an abrupt change from columnar epithelium of the endocervix to the stratified squamous epithelium of the ectocervix it is also called congenital squamo columnar junction as it was formed during fetal life during reproductive age the squamo columnar junction is located at variable distances from the external os in a post menopause woman the new squamo columnar junction is not visible and has receded into the endocervix this is a histological slide showing original squamo columnar junction on hne stain the picture on the right which is actual picture of the cervix illustrates the original squamo columnar junction at the external os level this abrupt change from columnar cells to stratified squamous epithelial cells is rarely seen if ever in adult life as mentioned earlier the original squamo columnar junction does not last for long it evolves over time in post pubertal period after the maturity of the hypothalamo pituitary gonadal axis and establishment of menstruation the original squamo columnar junction starts to grow outwards under the influence of estrogen produced by the ovaries consequently the cervix everts the outward migration of the squamo columnar junction is more pronounced in excess estrogen states for example pregnancy use of oral contraceptive pills for contraception etc the red velvety appearance on the ectocervix around the external os is referred to as ectropion this physiological change is not without consequences when exposed to the acidic environment of the vaginal secretions the fragile columnar epithelium of the ectropion breaks down and is shed and this is the beginning of a new process where the damaged portion is replaced in situ into squamous epithelium by the reserve cells remember the reserve cells under the columnar epithelium are bipotent that is they are capable of transformation into another mature type of epithelium which in this case is the squamous epithelium hence it is called squamous metaplasia in the past it was thought that the adjacent squamous cells grow sideways to cover the denuded area but it is not true an important point to note is that the process is patchy and by no means complete Originally it starts at the apex and at the base of cervical crypts and then the two ends meet somewhere in between The entire process of squamous metaplasia occurs in three stages in the first stage shown here which is called reserve cell hyperplasia the totipotential reserve cells start multiplying rapidly by mitosis 
in the next stage the multiplying reserve cells start to differentiate into squamous cells but the conversion is still incomplete in some areas only the basal and parabasal cells have formed and in other areas the development occurs up to the intermediate cell layer but the superficial cell layer is not formed in this stage hence it is called immature squamous metaplasia stage subsequently even the superficial squamous cells are formed giving rise to the stage called as the mature squamous metaplasia remember all the denuded areas are not in the same stage of metaplasia some areas may be in the first stage others in the second phase and some will be in the in the third stage at the completion of all the three stages a new squamo columnar junction develops towards the internal os as shown in the picture the area between the original and new squamo columnar junction is called as the transformation zone the reason why this area is important from the colposcopy point of view is that this is the area where there is enhanced cellular activity and is therefore prone to develop squamous cell carcinoma but before i go to that this squamous metaplasia causes one more thing but before i talk about that one more thing let me show you this diagram which shows lateral view of cut section of the cervix at the level of the squamo columnar junction in adult life it clearly demarcates the transformation zone so this is how a transformation zone is formed later in adult life in the next few slides i will point out the after effect of the formation of this new intermediate area called transformation zone the squamous metaplasia process leaves behind some telltale signs the patchy metabolic process fails to descend into the endocervical crypts therefore the fine glandular orifices of the crypts remain visible in some places later i will tell you the clinical importance of these crypts so stick on till the end during squamous metaplasia in some areas the newly formed squamous cells cover the functional columnar cells that produce mucus this causes the underlying cervical crypts of columnar epithelium the so called cervical glands to be blocked they continue to produce mucus but unlike before these secretions accumulate in situ as they have no drainage this accumulation is called a nemothian cyst clinically it looks like a white or yellowish round raised area on the transformation zone as shown in the picture mind you with modern ultrasound technology nemothensis can be observed on transvaginal sonography of cervix it is seen as a round anechoic area surrounding the endocervical canal marked by a green circle in this sonogram the transformation zone is the area of the cervix where the columnar epithelium has been replaced and or is being replaced by the metaplastic squamous epithelium in other words the transformation zone is the area between the original squamo columnar junction and the current one in premenopausal women the transformation zone is primarily located on the ectocervix after menopause and through old age the cervix shrinks due to decreasing levels of estrogen consequently the transformation zone may move partially and later fully into the endocervical canal for defining the transformation zone the upper limit that is the proximal extent is the most crucial feature to identify and therefore transformation zones are classified based on this there are three types of transformation zones type 1 where the upper limit of visibility is in the ectocervix that is it is fully visualized during colposcopic examination in type 2 transformation zone has the endocervical component but is still fully visualized on colposcopy and type 3 where the upper limit of the transformation zone 
is not visualized on colposcopy. This schematic diagram illustrates type 1 transformation zone. The gray dotted line represents the upper limit of visibility. The green dotted line represents the upper limit of transformation zone. The pink area on either side of the external os represents the transformation zone. Thus, the entire transformation zone is on the ectocervix. This finding on colposcopy is considered normal or adequate colposcopy. This is an actual picture of type 1 transformation zone on colposcopy after application of acetic acid. The treatment for type 1 transformation zone is as follows. Either a destructive or exigenal method may be used to treat it. This schematic diagram shows type 2 transformation zone. The green dotted line represents the upper limit of the transformation zone which has migrated into the endocervical canal but is still visible on colposcopy. The use of an additional colposcopic procedure such as endocervical forceps or eversion of the cervical lips with a cotton bud is useful in demonstrating the upper limit. The endocervical component may be small or large. These are photos of actual cases seen on colposcopy. In the photo on the right, the upper limit of transformation zone is visualized after use of an endocervical speculum. It may be possible to treat a type 2 transformation zone with a destructive technique but an exigenal technique is recommended. This schematic diagram represents type 3 transformation zone. The green dotted line represents the upper limit of the transformation zone which has migrated further into the endocervical canal and is now not visible on colposcopy. In other words, the lesion has an endocervical component, the upper limit of which is not visible. And thus, the colposcopy is considered as unsatisfactory or inadequate. The endocervical component may be small or large. These are photos of an actual case. In the photo on the right, the upper limit of transformation zone is not visualized even after the use of endocervical forceps. Excision is mandatory in this situation and destructive methods of treatment should not be used. It's all easy in theory to say this is this and this is that but not when it comes to actual cases. How can one identify the transformation zone on colposcopy? The proximal boundary of the sphevomal colonal junction is a well-defined entity and is easily identified. The distal boundary cannot be identified so easily. There is no definite line to demarcate the junction between the original and the metaplastic squamous epithelium. The outer extent of the transformation zone can be identified approximately based on the detection of the crypt openings or nevothian cysts furthest away from the sphemocolonal junction. There is another trick colposcopists use that is Schiller's test. They apply Schiller's or 5% Lugol's iodine to identify the extent of the transformation zone. It sometimes corresponds to the borderline between yellow or patchy and dark and mahogany brown iodine uptake as seen in the colposcopy picture on the right. So then, what are the features of a transformation zone? The transformation zone may have any of the features of metaplasia such as crypt openings, nemothian cysts, islands of columnar epithelium, fine mosaics or punctations and acetovite epithelium. Remember, mature metaplastic epithelium is often acetovite and is difficult to distinguish from low-grade pre-malignant lesions. Acetovite patches due to metaplasia are centripetal that is going towards the external loss but can sometimes be centrifugal that is spreading away from the external loss. There is something called as active transformation zone. Do you know what that is? The active transformation zone is where the process of metaplasia is continuing 
or where cervical intraepithelium neoplasia has developed. Having explained the two entities, let me put a question to you. Are the squamocolonar junction and transformation zone synonymous entities? If you have understood my talk, then you would give the correct answer, which is no. The terms transformation zone and squamocolonar junction are frequently used interchangeably in the literature. However, these are two distinct entities. The squamocolonar junction is the area in which the squamous epithelium of the ectocervix meets the columnar epithelium of the endocervix. The cervical transformation zone is a dynamic entity of metaplasia throughout a patient's life and is histologically the area where the glandular epithelium has been replaced by squamous epithelium by a process of metaplasia. Thus, the squamocolonar junction is part of the transformation zone, but the transformation zone comprises a larger area than just the squamocolonar junction. In the end, let me address the question, why study the transformation zone in the first place? Recent studies indicate squamocolonar junction to be a site of embryonic cell population with a top-down pattern of differentiation. The reserve cells are the progeny of embryonic cells with different susceptibilities to infection by HPV and therefore involved in malignant transformation. The transformation zone of the cervix is the site of origin of greater than 90% of precancerous lesions also called cervical intraepithelial lesions CIN and cancers. If you want to know more about this topic or any other topic in obstetrics and gynecology, please refer to my books Modern Gynecology, Modern Obstetrics and Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology and other books. The links are given below. They are available on Amazon.in. For purchase inquiries, contact me on this WhatsApp number. Also, please like, comment and share this channel and my other channel Modern OBGYN. Thank you. I have also published two question answer books which are particularly useful for exam going students. These are Clinical Cases in Obstetrics, 1000 plus questions and answers and Clinical Cases in Gynecology, 1000 plus questions and answers. These are also available on Amazon.in. You can also follow me on other social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. The links are given here. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, share it with your friends and also subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you for watching.